So here we go underneath here. Oh yeah. Cow. I've never seen anything quite like that. It's like it was still running when we stopped. That's all it took for the motor to take a giant. Sometimes this is how your day ends right here. Load up. She don't look pretty. Look at her go back there. We're gonna set records now. <laughs> The the Alright guys, you gotta understand, no one has loved on the GT350 like this guy right here. Thank you. Thank you. AAA's on the way. AAA's on the way? What do we got here? What do we have here, Jeff? Likely a blown 350. Very, very typical, maybe? I mean, I'm not gonna start this car again, but I'll put the clip up of what we... I already recorded that, right? Yep. Yeah. happened i just hope the car is not gone for long periods of time obviously um, I have and of course tunnel chaser everybody loves him and we chat all the time so this is his story what do you think is that the is that the mustang tick today we skipped the tick and went straight to the palsy phase dude and one of my favorite youtubers of all time all right guys, so I was out here doing a couple of mods on the car and making a video for that, and I discovered a problem that my coolant was running extremely low. And that is just after I filled it, I don't know, 2,000 miles ago or so. Um, so we definitely have a problem. So I'm giving you guys a warning. Before you buy a Ford, before you buy a Mustang or a GT350 or any Ford, especially given that there are certainly problems that, that some people are having with the engines, you better keep in mind what happens with their buyback division. It took three months to get the buyback from Ford for the GT, for the regular GT. It was a good outcome. I was satisfied with it. I was not satisfied with the abysmal customer service up to that point. The engine's basically seizing up, going out. In all honesty, guys, it is not something that you should worry about. All I'm saying is that once you do wind up the RPMs frequently or you go out for your nice weekend spirited drive or you go to track day, just check your oil after that. That's really all you have to do. And if you daily drive this car, just check it once in a while or at least more often than you would with your normal Mustang or normal vehicle or performance car. That's all that it comes down to, I think. All of this information I'm sharing with you guys, I've actually learned this from multiple Ford dealerships. I love your video speed phenom, but on this particular topic, you have no idea what you're talking about. They even fucking circled the problem for you. <clears throat> Oil level, checking the fluids is extremely important. There's no doubt about that, but these guys couldn't have prevented what happened to them. And when it happens to you, we'll be there for you, buddy. I promise, because it won't be long for the world. If you're drinking oil like crazy, I run that race car on the track at full song for 45 minutes, hammer down in what I feel is at least 9.9 .9 tenths of what that car can handle, and I don't use a drop of oil. None. So it is not a common GT350 thing. It is a common GT350 thing in motors that blow. And if this starts consuming oil like yours is and Jeff's was, and Tom's was, and several other guys. I don't know if, I think Tunnel Chasers was as well. Um, I just don't want anybody condemned for what they may or may not have done because they didn't do anything. Uh, and that doesn't mean didn't put oil in it. 
they didn't do anything to contribute to the engine failure. Engines basically seizing up, going out. In all honesty, guys, it is not something that you should worry about. I am not in the mood for that again. All right, well, hello and welcome to the channel. You're watching Shelby Exotics and I'm Ryan. And we are going to talk about track preparation today. This, this question's come up a number of times and I don't wanna be just known as the guy with the blown up GT350s because these are good cars, okay? Um, the engines do have some issues and there's not a whole lot you can do other than regular maintenance and so forth to prevent it. Uh, and unless you want to tear down your whole motor and balance the crank and, and do some other things. But generally speaking, if you got a GT350 or a GT350R, maintenance, all right? And the proper oils, synthetics, you know, the research that I've done on this car, I use, sorry about the wax and stuff, that's chemical guy stuff and that's for another video. This I feel is really important because we've gotten a lot of people that have asked us like, um, you know, what's the best way to prepare my GT350 or my GT350R for the track and or try to prevent any engine failure. Best thing you can do is, um, in my personal opinion, I would get an auto blip, which you can go to, I think it's auto-blip.com or just Google auto-blip. Um, I would definitely install one of those. Um, the reason being is that one of the risks on the track is the downshifting into, into the corners and sometimes in the center of the corner, Oftentimes it's not when you want to shift, but you get a long sweeping corner and it's just what you got to do. So the auto blip, what that does because of the pedal arrangement in the GT350 is extremely hard to heel toe. A lot of people say it's easy. Maybe it's my stubby size nine and a half shoe. Um, but to me, I just can't do it. The pedal placement is such that it's just too far away, right? The and it's, it's the distance here between here and here, right? You're supposed to be able to cock your foot, but you where your heel would normally be here, you just can't. You're already putting pressure on the brake. You're going to have to lift. It's not how far away left to right the pedal is. It's how far away they are depth-wise, okay? Because you start pushing on the, on the brake, and your heel just is nowhere near the gas yet, all right? And you're already at where you want to be for your brake pressure. And trying to kick that down, it, it just doesn't work. Uh, if, if you can bring those pedals, if you guys know how to do that, to bring them more even. Like in Rowdy, he has no auto blip, no nothing. And I heel toe him with zero issue. He is a piece of friggin' cake to heel toe the GT350 with stock pedal arrangement is not it just is not so back to the video i guess uh, I don't know. so that's one of the issues there what that creates is is a problem where you can spin when you spin there's a chance that you can roll the wheels backwards and still be in gear that puts a tremendous amount of stress on the motor people forget that if you have spun your gt350 on the track or off the track Chances are you might have had something to do with that motor blowing. Now me with my black R, Ford should build these things for new people to be able to drive them. And learning stick shifts and not necessarily money shifts because it will lock you out. The shifting is critical. You don't want to over rev this car, right? So if you've got a, the tuning capability, like myself, with this car tuned for E90, um, I had them lower the RPM because originally they had it set actually 9,000 RPM because I like to listen and I shift on listening. I would not recommend that for a new newcomer and I would have them dial it back to 7,800. I know that defeats the purpose, but you know, your risk of over revving the motor and doing damage to the bearings, which are the main Achilles heel of this car are very high, the higher the RPM. You're building heat, you're building friction. What can I do, Ryan, best to prepare my car? Checking your fluids, right? You wanna make sure that you've got the proper fluids in there. We talked about that a little bit. Me, I use Redline coolant. I use uh, Redline um, diff, but I'm running a Drexler diff in this. 
So this isn't the stack diff anymore, but still, I would put synthetic fluids in. I would upgrade from anything that came from the factory. That's just me. Is I would install or have installed Watson harness bar. You have to take out some interior components and you gotta cut two holes if you have an R or remove the back seat if you have a regular GT350 and put two holes back through the package tray uh, or the, the back part of the package tray. Usually the package tray is just the top. So I would install a Watson harness bar. That so you wanna check your brake wear, right? I'm gonna flip this around. Okay, so you're gonna to wanna to check your brake pads. Now I elected to upgrade these particular brakes, but they're very similar to the Brembo's. These are racing brakes. This, these are coming off um, in the next week to week and a half because we have the new Brembo set coming for these. And you guys are gonna be, you guys are gonna be blown away by it, okay? I'm not putting the stock Brembo's back on. I don't wanna tell you yet. You gotta watch. These work just like the Brembo's and you wanna check your brake pads to make sure that you've got at least half of you're using the stock pads. You know, if it's your first time out, you wanna make sure you've got at least at least more than 50% of the original pad before you go out for any track day. That's my rule, um, if I, but I'm racing this too. So my typical track weekend will involve probably five sessions. All right, folks, welcome to the trailer now. Uh, we're gonna go through a couple of essential tools that you'll wanna have with you when you go to the track just for a simple track day. Now I've got, I've got mounds and mounds of stuff. And if you guys wanna know what all this stuff is and why I have it. Everything is used uh, and frequently used multiple times throughout a track weekend. So we will go into the heavy duty track stuff in another video. What we're gonna do, if you just wanna go out and do a track day, what I would recommend that you have before you go, especially if you're interested in doing multiples, because if you think you're gonna love doing a track day, you're super excited about it, you're gonna be hooked, just like me and the rest of the guys. So. These are just some essential things that you're gonna to wanna to have with you so you don't look like a complete noob at the track. All right, so first and foremost, we have here our torque D regulator remover and extractor, otherwise known as an impact wrench, all right? One of the things that you're gonna want that you may not think you need, but you will, is a deep well, because I didn't have one of these the first time and that, that made me look stupid. And I don't wanna look stupid even though I'm looking stupid right now. All right, this is a three quarter inch deep well impact. The reason is, is on the GT350, GT350R, forge lines, any of them, the offset spacing in the front and rear of the GT350 requires that you have that or you're gonna scratch your rims. And you're gonna look stupid doing it and then you're gonna kick yourself anytime that you see that scratch. So. You're gonna to wanna to make sure that you have that. And for another critical item, through this priest, how many things do I got on in here for crying out loud? Apparently we are big into air movement here at Shelby Exotic. So back to our couple key items. Impact wrench, deep well socket, tire pressure gauge, all right? If you, if you don't wanna pop for uh, the $30 or $50 one like we have here, this was on Amazon. 25 bucks now you're going to need a compressor which we'll get to in a minute but you can do just the pressure gauge here which is much more accurate or i'm pretty confident i've got the regular slider gauges you've all seen them they look like a pen they're about yay long they've got the slider that comes out even that is better than nothing okay so make sure you at least stop at the gas station and grab one of those because if you just go to the track with your GT350 and run those tires at 32 pounds, you're gonna get off the track. Well, let's be real. You're gonna run them at 50 pounds because that's probably where they're set right now, somewhere between 40 and 50 pounds, which is way too friggin' high at the track. And you're not gonna get the maximum performance out of the car. Okay, so the first thing you wanna do is you wanna drop your tire pressures down. I would try somewhere between 24 and 26 pounds. And then what you do, is you come in and you take your tire pressures again as soon as you get off the track. You want at hot temperature on the track or just off the track at 32 pounds. That's your, that's your optimal tire range at operating temperature. Okay, next thing, air compressor, okay? Uh, it's good to have just one of the, I've got a couple of them because you never know when one's gonna fail, but I've got a, a Black & Decker down here. 
just a simple tube tank. And then I've got another twin tube that's in the garage, um, M-Glow, that I bring as well. The reason is, is that when you leave the track, chances are your tires are going to be somewhere between 21 and 18 and a half pounds cold. And that means not at operating temperature, you know, 30 minutes after the car's had time to cool off, you take the pressures. What once was 32 because of the expansion of the air is now going to be 18. You're going to want to pump that back up. You can go to a gas station. I just don't like to take the chance of curbing my wheels and stuff. And it fits nicely in the trunk of the car too. So you don't have to have the trailer and all this shit. You can just put one of those little black and deckers. They're like 40 or 50 bucks at Meyer or Walmart. Pick one up. They come with the tubes and everything. And uh, that other tire pressure gauge looks like this, by the way. Uh, simple tools to bring along. Maybe, you know, a couple different size, big crescent wrenches in case you run into issues. A socket set. I'd buy one of these Craftsmen. Well, I don't say I'd buy one of them. Um, I pretty much buy all of them if I can. So I've got like six or eight of them in here of just different uh, different styles of tools, you know, different socket sets, screwdrivers, pliers, just those those cheapy sets you buy at, at Meyer, again, Walmart. So they work in a pinch. And then we keep all of our nice snap-on stuff in here. Oh, the other thing you want, Loctite. You know, if you're going to track on a regular basis, chances are you're going to have to change pads on the track and shit like that. You're going to want Loctite around uh, for that as well. Those are, I would say, the key tools I would have. Uh, as you go, you're going to want to get another set of, of rims and tires. I run forge lines. Uh, you know, you can run 6Gs. Um, you know, whatever. Lighter's better. That's what you want to go with. There's nothing wrong with going cheap. You just want to make sure you go light and that the, the it's not a super soft aluminum that's going to bend. Um, the other stuff that I've got here, these are scales. Um, these are the pro slot scales that are wireless. So these pads right here, we pull those out and park the car on them. And you can take your weights. You guys don't necessarily need those. You are going to need oil. Make sure, guys, that you use 5W50, full synthetic. Do it to spec. And you're good to go. Make sure your coolant is full. Make sure you got redline coolant in there. Get a lower temperature thermostat. Get the catch can for the GT350. If you have a spin-on oil filter, upgrade to the canister filter before you go on the track and oil it down for everybody. Because 18 foot-pounds Ford does not work. Ask Pit Race. They had to spend uh, about two and a half hours cleaning up the oil from mine. So that's a brief overview of the tools. Now we will head back up. One of the key elements that we need is right around the corner here. And you're going to need that deep well socket for it. Important tool that you can have, and this is just tools, guys. These aren't seatbelts and things we're going to talk about in a minute. Torque wrench. Torque wrench. Torque wrench. Torque wrenches. Guys, torque specs on the GT350 are the most important thing that you can do other than keep it full of oil. But this is the most important tool you can have. The Voodoo creates harmonics and vibrations that can take a spin-on oil filter at 20 pounds of pressure and back it off. It can take lug nuts and back them completely out. It can take motor mount bolts and back them completely out. Okay, so this is your new best friend. Anything on the GT350 that you unbolt or take off, before you do so, do your research on what the torque specs are for that bolt. Get the specs from Ford Performance. But guys, do your research. This is your most important safety tool that you can own. Get one. I'm not kidding. You will regret it if you don't. All right. Now let's go talk about what you need actually on the car. You're fucking sexy. All right. Even all parked back here, you're in the doghouse right now because you're busted. You are still a sexy bitch. You are. Don't you fucking look at me like that. Compressor I was telling you about a moment ago. We got the Range Rover. We'll you'll see a video coming out on that here in a little bit. We finally have located you, you fucking unicorn. See how our 
See, we got bad cylinder up in there or pot, whatever you want to call them. Yeah, these for a Land Rover Range Rover, not a sport. It is not a sport. Supercharged though. You can't find these anywhere. Anywhere. Found them in a junkyard. Finally. And I'm not paying $3,000 for you from Land Rover. All right, guys. These are your tool kits that I was telling you about earlier. Pretty good. Scan back and forth. You see metric, standard, set, Allen keys, Torx heads, what have you. You can watch that back in slow motion if you need to. But these are critical components. This is an end gauge for tuning. This is our Hellcat tuner here. And this is our GT350 TR E90. Isn't that pretty? Hell yeah, brother. CH057. We love you, girl. That's the number of my GT350, by the way. It busts the 057 on the side of the car as well. All right. Now we're finally going to go see what we need to put on the car. Girl. Okay. All right. Now we're going to talk about what we want to put in the car. Now we've talked about the Watson. It's actually a harness bar. A lot of people call it a roll cage. But basically, it is just this part of the cage that's in my car, right? And it hoops up to the top. Well, you'll see what it does. But anyway, it's just this piece here. You'll see my harnesses are through it. And what this does, okay, you don't have to have the seat. If you've got an R, your harnesses will pass, pass through. But that harness bar, I would definitely recommend getting safe craft harnesses, okay? There's a couple different places you can get them from. But there's a rule in NASA, okay, that we have to get out of the car from totally seated, hands on the wheel, wheel on, to out of the car in under 10 seconds. And I can do it in just over five and that's because the safe craft has this guy on it. All of your buckles buckle into there and you literally just give this thing a turn that is about 33 degrees. It's about a third of the, the circumference distance that you're just gonna turn it and you're out, you're done. I've never had them come off while I'm driving. The turn is just long enough, but man, you can get out quick. They're comfortable, they're tight. I point harness, but two belts, whatever, that's where I got confused. You won't need the, well, you won't be able to put it in, but this is the submarine belt. You're gonna get the four point harnesses, which are just here and here. What the harness bar does is number one, keep you safe. Number two, it ties you into the seat and does not let you lean back and forth. You will feel the car and it will do better for you as a rookie to improve your lap times to install a good harness bar. Just the overall feeling and confidence that you will get when you're looking out of the out of the cockpit like this, you're just tied in. You feel everything that the car is doing. I mean, every undulation in the road, in the pavement, in the car torquing or whatever it's doing, you're just connected. That's the best way I can say it. Auto blip is right here. This is what the auto blip is that I was telling you about earlier. It's a simple install. You can have your mechanic do it. He'll probably only charge you an hour. Uh, but it's wired right into your fuse box and then it then into the clutch and the parking brake relays and the cruise control and does its magic and you can actually change uh, the delay from the time that the clutch and brake are hit at the same time to when the blip actually happens and you can also adjust the duration there which is the length of which you're it's actually giving its throttle so you don't have to worry about over revving it too much it can just be a wow whatever you want to, whatever sound effect you want to throw in there. All right, so harness bar, that to me was a critical item. It is a tougher install because you still have, uh, I've got three going back there, but basically if you take this bar here out, it's that one and this one, okay? But you still have to put those in and you got to cut holes through that back panel. You got to be prepared to do that uh, if you have a GT350, you can remove your rear seat and there's a rear seat delete kit online that you can get. I think it's, I want to say it's as cheap as $200 now uh, for that cover. I would highly recommend the harness bar, guys, if you really want to go fast and be safe. Just tell your wife it's for safety. She will let you buy it almost immediately. Okay. Okay. The other thing that you're going to want to have 
Again, right here you think you're in the good without a deep well socket. And then you come up to the front and you realize, well, I'm screwed. And you won't be able to get them in there without scratching your wheel, AKA, hi, scratch the fuck out of it. So don't be stupid like me. These, these are my rain tires. I know they're Mustang 6G and they're the lookalikes to the R. They are my crap wheels. I bought them off a guy, he didn't want them anymore, and I got them cheap. So those are my rain wheels. What are stacked up over here are my race wheels. If you're gonna track the car, I bought an extra set. So now I actually have three sets all together that I could put slicks on. Um, if you're going to run the Pilot Sport Cup 2s, as expensive as they are, you may want to look at running these and just putting them on a different set all together. Then you don't have to worry about trashing your rims. You can keep your carbon fiber ones or your aluminum painted ones there for the stock GT350 deal. Uh, nice, and you can beat the snot out of these because you will beat them. Uh, of these two sets of forge lines, I have three rims that are already bent, but they're still balanceable. Just to let you know how hard these things get hit because you will be going fast, faster than you ever thought you could go. And here's the other set of forge lights here. But these are the Hoosier R7s, and I am running 315, 30, 19s. And that's what I'm running on this car at all four corners, but I wouldn't recommend it because I had to put, I had, had these built, but these are uh, 15 millimeter uh, offset spacers. So they give me clearance both for the uh, for the brakes, uh, as well as give me enough width where I can put the 315s on. For you guys, I would recommend running the 305s all the way around, unless you can get some 15 millimeter spacers to put on the front. 305s fit without the spacers at all four corners. All right, um, and if you don't have a trickle charger, get one. The GT350 batteries are known for going bad. Those are the key things that I think you guys could do that, that put you in the best position to get the most out of the car and minimize the damage. Really guys, there's not much you can do with the motor other than what we explained earlier with not spinning the car around. If you do spin, hit the clutch or pop it into neutral. And that's where the auto blip and some other things will help you keep from spinning. Anytime I've seen anybody spin in a GT350, as a newbie, because they're not pushing the car beyond its limits yet, is downshifting into a corner, at which point your rear, brake, your rear tires are acting like a brake, locking up, and you'll spin. All right, guys, so that kind of rounds out at least what I've done. It's just critical. I check my fluids after every session. People will wait and they'll do them on, you know, every track day, that type of thing. I mean, I know a guy named Tom, he was burning like a quart and a half a track day. If you're doing that, if you're burning that much oil, your motor's going to be toast no matter what. Go out and drive it, take it on the track, just know it's not long for the world. If you're using that much oil, I don't think, I don't think we've had one made it to 20,000 miles yet. Maybe Tom's had 20 or 24 but that's it. That's the max mileage you get off them. Usually they blow within 5,000 miles of when they start burning oil like that. Is there anything you can do when they start blowing? No. And the dealers won't listen to you. If you go in and tell them, they can't do anything until it blows up. They can't. That's just how it works. Um, if it ain't broke, they can't fix it. That's the deal. So that's all I got for today, guys. We'll get into a much more in-depth video on more detail of the scales. I didn't get into camber gauges. I didn't get into caster gauges. I didn't get into uh, any of the um, actual feeler gauges that we've got for the brakes and other things to, to set the car up or the motion control suspension, uh, how to adjust ride height. We'll do all of that. If you guys wanna see that, I'd love to show you. I really would. So thanks for joining us today. If this is your first time here, please like, subscribe, and comment. Thank you very much for sticking around this long, and uh, have a great day. Lots of videos coming from inside, guys, because guess what? It's wintertime now in Michigan, and it sucks. This guy's getting shipped out to California here in the next couple of weeks, 
and we're going to be flying out there and uh, we'll be getting some regular footage for you guys even throughout the winter. So we'll keep you updated on the C8R progress. Run into a couple of bumps in the road on that. Apparently the C8R is not really a car for sale, just like the FP350S. So we got to pull some connections, see what we can do. We'll get her done one way or another. We always do. Have a good night. Holy we'll shit. I can't believe I, I forgot to tell you to get a jack. Of all the things. Pick up a jack. Get on Amazon and make sure you pick a lightweight one. They're a little more expensive. I think Sunbeam or some others make them. Or Sun River, whatever. The jack's not as important as the weight, all right? Because they're heavy, they're hard to store, and you will run it into your foot several times. That's just how racing works. Uh, but you want a jack, and I would pick up four jack stands as well. Especially if you plan on getting a spare set of tires, you're going to want the jack stands because you won't always have a buddy around to help you with this stuff. So an extra set of hands like jack stands, um, you know, a winch on your trailer, stuff like that. Uh, keeps you independent. Make sure you can do stuff yourself. So anyway, sorry for the PS, but I felt it was pretty important. So pick yourself up a jack, some jack stands. Uh, what I ended up picking up was down on the Range Rover down there. I got the real, ex I got the real expensive ones. The, uh, they're like, a, they're, a, they're aluminum. They're red and, and silver. So if you look on Amazon, you Google jack stands. They're the expensive red and silver ones. That's how good of a YouTuber I am. That's a nice outtake. You and you just roll into Meyer, and you see where your son parks is a good indication whether or not he takes care of your vehicles. He didn't just park away from the building. He parked for Car W. Freaking Griswold to park out here. First ones in, first ones to leave. Okay. Good boy, Cameron. <laughs>